don't, uh, is our studio your main tool? Yes. Okay, so this will still apply because even though it's based on Jupyter machinery, the way we've built the Jupyter stack, it's extremely modular, and actually our studio runs on top of these layers as well. So there's nothing, it's not specifically about the Python stuff or even Jupyter notebooks with other kernels. It's basically about ena enabling the sharing of any kind of computational work uh, through the web in an, in an easier fashion. And it's mostly, um, tr in a sense, driven by this quote uh, that, uh, that David Donahoe, who's faculty at Stanford in the stats department, but who was really paraphrasing a geophysicist. Uh, David Donahoe was in here, he was basically channeling um, the kind of mindset that John Clairbaut uh, from, from Stanford Geophysics had pioneered for many years. Uh, Clairbaut had, uh, before Linux distributions were a thing, uh, before the web was really much of a thing, he had this thing called the Stanford Unix for Geophysics, I think it was called. And as far as I understand, I've never, I never saw it in action myself, but as far as I know, um, the Stanford Unix for Geophysics was effectively a packaging of Solaris, of, of, of Sun, Sun OS uh, Unix, um, with make files bundled in a way that would make it very easy for anyone to replicate their scientific work. And it's something that John came up with, basically not out of a concern for reproducibility in the sciences, but simply saying, I just want my PhD students to be productive, keep the ground running. I don't want them to spend the first four years of their PhD getting to where the previous person was, and then actually do something at the end. Uh, but rather I want them to come here, grab this bundle of the work of the previous person, hit make, Every figure comes up, everything runs. Then they spend a couple of months studying how that works, kind of getting, and then they can begin building their own new work. And that kind of pioneered this mode of, of thinking that what, what really, the real scientific work isn't the PDF of the paper that we get in nature science or whatever, but actually the, the work behind that. If, if we were mathematicians, it would be, this wouldn't even be an argument, because mathematicians would say, of course, the statement of the theorem isn't the work, it's the proof of the theorem that matters. But in the rest of sciences, we've kind of lost our way a little bit, and people have been advocating for this uh, for a while. Um, and the tool, the first tool that I want to show you is something called Binder. And Binder is a tool that was basically motivated by that quote um, and started technically by someone uh, named Jeremy Freeman, a neuroscientist who's now at the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative, but he did this originally when he was at uh, Genelia Farm on the East Coast. And Binder is a web-based tool that effectively boils down to give me the path of a repository, of a Git repository, it could be GitHub, but it could be any Git repo online, any publicly visible repository. And as long as that repository follows best practices, it uses typically Jupyter, but as I said, it could also have our studio bundled in it. And very importantly, the dependencies needed to run the code in that repository are given explicitly. Right? You tell me in a machine readable way, what libraries does that thing need? Because otherwise there's no, I mean, there, there is no magic bullet, right? You have to follow a minimum of best practice Give me a file that says these are my libraries that I need. And you can do that in a format that is Python friendly, like requires an NCXT, an install.r script, the, like, the moral equivalent for Julia, or even a Docker file. And get, uh, Binder uses a couple of technical tools that build, basically built on, build up upon Docker. Docker, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is a way of basically bundling a very lightweight virtual machine-like thing that, is, uh, that gives you basically a virtual computer and a file, if you will. Um, it's a Linux runtime, um, and it run, it's very well supported today on Mac, Linux, and Windows. So modern versions of every OS support it very well. Um, and it uses uh, a cloud deployment tool called Kubernetes to make it to make this uh, run smoothly in the cloud. But basically, if you follow these best, these simple practices, then you can share your work. Um, I want to quickly uh, flag, uh, flash through a couple of slides of a course where I actually use this. But the first course that I taught here at Berkeley was called Collaborative and Reproducible Data Science. I'm not going to go into all the details, um, but at a high level, it was a course where we tried to take kind of the, the core skills of what I would call healthy, hygienic, modern com scientific computing. Um, version control for everything. In this case, it was done in Python, if we are done in R. Automation of all processes with, uh, with make. Um, using an open, source, an open source stack for your work. Documenting your work with modern tools. Testing your code. Having continuous integration so that as you do your work, those tests are done by machines, not by you. So that as you, as you work in a, in a natural way, the systems uh, in the background track what you're doing. And finally, using tools like this binder to bundle the lot into an artifact that is actually a live, interactive, executable result. And at the end of the, the, the term, these, uh, these uh, students, mostly undergraduate, grad students from many disciplines, 
um, actually submitted their final project in this kind of what I call now kind of the standard playbook of a well-packaged kind of Donahoe style reproducible artifact where the data was either included in the repo or it was linked to it if it was too big to be included because that, that's a, a tricky problem. The code had tests. Um, there was both a main narrative story of the scientific problem being worked on and the supporting notebooks that actually said this is how this figure is made, this is how this table is made, because the narrative flow of a paper is a little bit different from the narrative flow of the details of getting any specific number, and you want both. Um, there was support for automating this reproducibility with proper with a proper environment file, with a proper main file to run the law, and good practices such as like following proper licensing practice and having a proper readme. This is not difficult. These were undergrads who were not CS undergrads, they were from many, many different disciplines. And at the end, this is what they were turning, the, turning in. They were turning in Git repos that had a proper make file with, right there, a run me and binder uh, command, right? And they had their analysis notebooks, there was code that had tests. Um, the main narrative story was turned into a proper kind of paper-like PDF. Uh, and so this is something where once you adopt these practices, it just becomes completely natural to do it. There's, no, there's nothing sort of particularly magic about it. Um, let me show you what Binder looks like in practice. So this is a repository. Um, this is a repository from a geophysicist who couldn't be at this workshop because she's at a uh, machine learning workshop right now down in, um, in LA, but this repository um, is, uh, is made of labs from the geosci.xyz project. geosci.xyz uh, geosci.xyz um, is a project led by Lindsay Hickey, she's a postdoc in my group for background in geophysics, and they develop open source uh, research tools for, for geophysics and educational tools. Um, and uh, and this, is a, this particular one is a repository that contains uh, labs and demos, uh, labs and demos for this, and it has one of these buttons that says launch and binder. What did they have to do for this repository to be able to have this button? The only thing this repository has is this file right here. Sorry. I require an environment YAML file, which is a file that says these are the dependencies. That's all that binder needs. So this is not so hard. And by the way, by doing this, you know what you know what libraries you need. So it makes it also easier for you to replicate. And um, it's they're also encoded in the requirements mode uh, format. But these are basically uh, they're encoding the same information in two different formats. And the moment the moment that is available, you can go to mybinder.org, type the URL for that repo, and binder will make a binder for it. And in fact, binder will nicely give you the little button, the, the necessary HTML, to put this little icon and button right there on the readme. So it, it's all done for you. This is how you would do it. Um, and by the way, now that he's here, uh, Chris Holgrath, who's standing in the back, um, is one of the leads on the Binder project. Uh, and we'd be happy to answer your questions. So if I give this URL here, I can actually choose, oh, when this thing starts, what file do I want to open by default? Um, and now here it gives me both the URL to to link to, and this is how I can copy that button. So this is the HTML and the markdown necessary to get that little button into my readme file. So it's basically made as point and click as possible. And once we go to that, this is what comes up. I just clicked on that link, the, the page was loading in the background, just to show you that there's you know, nothing hidden. This is what happens. You click on this, and you're taken to this. This, it shows you a preview, a static preview of that notebook, while the actual server launches. So what's happening is a Docker image has been made for that repository with all of its dependencies and a node is being spun in the cloud for you for free and after a few seconds up it comes. And now what you have is a real live version of all the code in that repo that we can begin to run. So we can run a simulation such as this one. This is a specific notebook that they've created to illustrate. In this case, it's the problem. It's an interactive app and I wanted to very briefly show you the kinds of things that become possible with this. This is an example of a geophysics app to, uh, to, do, to model um, the problem of detecting a cylindrical target like a pipe or a tunnel underground. 
uh, which in this case is done, one of the methods that is used for that is basically you inject current uh, uh, into the ground and you detect and you detect the current, uh, the current that comes out. And here what they've done is they've actually built, using, using Jupyter widgets, they've built the necessary interactive apps to say, this is where I want to place my sources. Let's say that I have a cylinder with high resistivity, so like a tunnel has a very large resistivity, so something like 10 to the 8 ohms air is basically non-conductive, so it has a neurotransmitter resistivity, and so when I hit enter, when I change the resistivity of that, this indicates me that the kernel is running, and now the plot updates, so that's, that's what the resistivity looks like. If I want to look at what would the currents look like, I can click here J. That's, this is a little geophysics app that basically for someone in the domain allows them to explore very quickly. And we're actually running, that's actually running that code. I can change all the parameters, I can look at different properties. And this is a web URL. Any of you right now goes to that repo on GitHub, you click the, the binder button and you're here. With zero installation, you can share your entire workflow with someone because this URL up here is a live executable URL. We actually have uh, have support from Google. Google is basically sponsoring uh, the cloud uh, the cloud services to run this for free. But the way Binder is designed, it actually is a federated service where other binders can be run. So this is the, the main public demo binder, but other institutions can run a Binder-like service. Uh, Chris, how many are running right now? Um, at least like five other ones at like major kind of research institutions. You can actually, uh, another class of Binder called OVH, which is the European Cloud Provider, just this morning. It went live this morning? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So, so this is to show you very briefly that this is the kind of thing that if you follow this, you can give someone literally a single URL where they can plug into your codes and your analysis. And that build file can be as nasty as complicated as it needs to be, right? You can have a Docker file that has some horrifically painful Fortran C++ build that you manage to get running once, right? And like, all right, put it in there. And at least people can use it, right? And that Docker container will run as long as we have Docker support. Now, afterwards, of course, do, if they want to take this into their laptop and run it forever and install it in a different place, they will have to go through some additional effort. But it's much easier to convince someone to do that if they've already seen what it does in action, if they've been able to play with it, if they maybe put their own data file and played with it a little bit with, without, people are willing to go through some of that pain after they have a reason to do so. But if the first thing they hit is, well, if you want to see what my code does, please waste the next weekend or two dealing with my installation hassles. For again, you've lost it. People's attention span on that problem is about five to 10 minutes. So this kind of reduces it to about a minute. So for the most part, you're under in within the happy window where you can still hook them. And then you can drag them through the pain of installing your stuff. But by now, they're kind of hooked. So Binder, think of Binder as a, as a, as a, as a fishing lure to, to hook collaborators um, into your workflow. Um, and the second tool, yes, yes, please, questions. So if, if we find a repository that doesn't have a, that doesn't have a, a, binder, a binder link, can we just copy that into our account and add it and then do this to it? Yes, so the question I want to repeat it for the back, if you find a repository that doesn't have a little happy binder button, can we just copy it, fork it into your own account and, and add and add this? And the answer is yes. If it had already a proper requirements or environment file or the equivalent for dependencies, it may just work out of the box. You can put, the fact that the author didn't give it a button doesn't mean Binder won't try. So if you find a repo and it happens to have a proper requirements specification, you can put the URL for that repo into the Binder uh, URL and Binder will try, right? It'll try to make a repo, it'll try to make a, a, a runtime for it. Now, you may find that it's missing a dependency, maybe they forgot something. What I would suggest is the moment you get it working, send that pull request back to the author with the little button added, right? Add, add the little button, copy, the, copy into the readme.md file, the little HTML, the, the little blurb of markdown for the binder button once you confirm that it works, and then the official repo will be binder file. And that's what we've done for many, many things, uh, is we've, we found repos that look really interesting scientifically, but the author didn't do that. We go that extra little, very, it's not the extra mile, it's more like the extra 100 feet do that work, send, send a, a pull request back and, and they update the public repo. So yes, other questions? Yes. Is there a cookie cutter template for Binder? Is there a cookie cutter template for Binder? Uh, Chris, what's the best way to answer that? I mean, I think that there, I think that there is, if I remember correctly, at the URL. Um, although, in a sense, the, in my experience, the value of the cookie cutter templates grows as the 
structure you did becomes more complicated. And really the whole point of Binder is like minimize the number of steps between a, a typical pre-existing repository and the version of that that will work with Binder. So in some sense, it's as, as Fernando said, it's like it's quote unquote just adding a requirement set TXT file. That's it. You don't need to do anything other than that to get it working. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend just trying it, and I'm going to try to find a, the URL to, to grab it. And 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 I, I very strongly resonate with that view because I think I think that what what Binder is trying to do is say just do the right thing that you should be doing anyway, and we'll do, and we'll do the rest. Right, so if the right thing, you should have your dependencies explicitly encoded in your repos, right? Just as a matter of as a matter of good practice, so that you actually know when you come back to a given project what the hell it, you needed to run, and so that you can create a virtual environment that encapsulates that. So if you're doing that, that should be it. Uh, now there are a few uh, there are a few tweaks and customizations for which a cookie cutter might be useful, like just to show the post build and those things. Yes. Some people have done is built binder hub deployments that are like domain specific. So, for example, in Geo, I think you. I'm about to show it. I'm, I'm coming there because we're, and also time wise, uh, so then we don't want to run into the schedule, but I'm going to go ahead. Uh, so, so deployments that are more domain specific, and then they have like a very standard, very complicated, like basic stack, and then they just want to build around like that. They have deployed like domain specific cookie cutter that says, you know, this will tell you how to get 90% of the So Pangeo, uh, timely introduction, this is the other thing I want to talk to you about. Pangeo is a project that was originally led by Ryan Abernathy at Columbia uh, with colleagues from NCAR um, in Boulder. So this is uh, what you're seeing there is someone is zooming into an image and you see some color bar that begin to kind of activate and get, get busy here. And, uh, and after a few minutes, the image just refines. What's the big deal? You zoom into an image, it's blurry, it refines, right? That's 100 gigs of satellite imagery all over the whole Washington state. In order to do that refinement, you need to process that. Uh, I can't remember how many nodes there are. There's a whole big distributed cluster running in the cloud doing that. The point of Pangeo is that it should be as intuitive as zooming in Photoshop, right? And that Pangeo, what Pangeo does is it takes Jupyter Hub, it takes the Jupyter machinery, it takes um, X-Array, which is a, a NumPy-like library, but for uh, very oriented towards geosciences with, with additional metadata features. Um, and it takes the Dask distributed computing library and bundles those in a way that makes it very easy and very friendly for geoscientists to use this cloud-native distributed stack in as easy a way as interactively zooming and playing with that, and tries to deploy that kind of with, with a pattern of saying, let's not reinvent all of these tools, let's actually Let's actually reuse the publicly available stack, document how to use it for a discipline, very much follow the cookie cutter kind of approach of saying for this discipline, this is what you want, rather than we need to rebuild something, um, something wholesale. And they actually do a very good job of contributing back upstream. So um, together with, uh, with folks from the Pangeo team, Laurel and I recently submitted a grant proposal to kind of integrate some of these, um, some of these tools more specifically in some of, in some of areas that are of interest to you, I would strongly encourage you to take a look um, at Pangeo. The website is pangeo.io. I just want to make you basically aware that this community exists, this, these tools exist, um, and they're very, very, they're very open and very friendly, um, and they're uh, they're interested in, in finding other other subdomains. Uh, Ryan himself is not a hydrologist; he's a physical oceanographer who works in sort of like mesoscale, mesoscale turbulence. But uh, but the tools themselves are designed and thought uh, as being applicable to a wide range of communities. Um, and uh, I'm finally going to close with uh, two, list, uh, two links that Lindsay um, sent me. This one is a repo called Awesome Open Geoscience, um, and this one is called Awesome Open Atmospheric Ocean Climate Science. Um, and I can send these links to Laurel or Dino or someone who will put them in your Slack or mailing list or what, whatever it is so that you don't have to try to screenshot my uh, tiny fonts. Um, but I'll send all of these links uh, to, uh, to this uh, interactive geoscience demos um, and these two lists of open, open software and open tools in the geosciences that you might find interesting. And I'm going to stop there because I don't want to mess with your schedule. This was completely impromptu. This was just meant to show you tools that you might find useful. Uh, Chris and I are happy to chat with you, but otherwise you have, a work, you have work to do and I don't want to 
that's your schedule. So thank you. Thank you.